Uh, hi everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, welcome. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, this year's uh, PACES conference uh, organized by Pamukkale University English Language and Department. Uh, and I would like to first thank uh, Mehmet Ali Hoca and uh, all other colleagues in the department uh, for organizing such a great event uh, that gives an opportunity for um, our uh, students, our friends to present their research and share their research with us. Uh, so thank you to all of you who have contributed to this organization and thank you to uh, all our participants for um, devoting your time to this session uh, this morning. Uh, in this session uh, we have uh, Jansu Gunesh. Uh, I hope Jansu is with us. Yes, uh, who yes. will be presenting her research to us. Um, I'd like to first introduce uh, Jansu and then I'm going to leave the floor to her. Uh, Jansu Gunesh is a senior. Two moments because I'm having a problem with my uh, computer. Of course, of course. Uh, and meanwhile, perhaps I can introduce you Jansu. Would that be fine? Okay. Uh, so, uh, John Sugunesh is a senior student at the Department of Foreign Language Education at Middle East Technical University. Her interests are uh, playing the piano and literature, in particular English literature, women's uh, Gothic and gender studies in literature. Uh, and today she's going to present us uh, her research on um, dreams and hallucinations in women's Gothic, unconscious reflections of uh, women's oppression. Um, and when she is ready, uh, she's going to start her presentation. After we hear her presentation, I'm sure we'll have some time for uh, questions and comments. Uh, so I'd be happy to take your questions and comments after Jansu's presentation. Um, Jansu, whenever you're ready, please let me know. If you like, you can start, Chansa. We can see you. So, uh, um, hello, everyone. Video. OK, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Firstly, I would like to thank for those who put effort to give us this amazing opportunity. Um, this is the second time actually I attend this conference as a speaker and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. Now uh, I will try to share my screen. Um, you can see it, right? Uh, yes, Johnson. Yes, OK. Um, Today, uh, I will present a paper titled Dreams and Hallucinations in Women's Gothic, Unconscious Reflections of uh, Women's Oppression. Um, dreams and hallucinations are widely used elements in literature in order to reveal several things about the characters, the plot, the past and the future. And one of the most common purposes of using dreams uh, and hallucinations is revealing the vicious fears or hidden desires of the characters. And in women's Gothic, most accepted as a separate culture by women dealing with women experience, dreams and hallucinations often reflect the repressed desires, fears, and oppression of women characters. And the oppression women characters experience daily because of a tyrant figure reveals itself in dreams and hallucinations. And this tyrant is always a cisgender heterosexual man who is their partner. In this presentation, uh, you can still see the slides, right? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, okay, thank you. In this presentation, uh, I will, uh, by looking at two examples of women's Gothic, Elizabeth Bowen's The Demon Lover and Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, uh, I will try to see in which ways dreams and hallucinations are used to reflect women experience. And the literary works we will be examining share some common uh, themes such as domestic violence, oppression of women and women's domestic incarceration. So I will be starting my presentation talking about women's Gothic, how it differs from Gothic literature itself, why it's called women's Gothic 
its themes and characters. And followingly, uh, I will move on with talking about the function and the role of dreams and hallucinations in women's Gothic. And finally, I will examine how dreams and hallucinations function in Elizabeth Bowen's The Demon Lover and Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper. So uh, I will start uh, with what is women's Gothic? Gothic literature is a literary genre that covers horror, fear, death and dread. And women's Gothic, on the other hand, is produced by women and queer people focusing on women experience and queer experience, reflecting their wishes, desires and fears. And women's Gothic, also referred as female Gothic, lesbian Gothic, queer Gothic, is a literary genre or a subgenre that differs from Gothic literature in the sense that in women's Gothic, despite the common elements with Gothic literature, uh, the source of the fear is a man. And most importantly, uh, women's Gothic feed on women experience and reflect the oppression that they face. Women's Gothic expresses uh, the, uh, expresses the woman experience of oppression, repression, domestic violence, entrapment within the household, domestic incarceration and rape. And it also expresses discontent towards patriarchy. In women's Gothic, the threat is not something supernatural, unknown or a stranger. It's not from the outside and just the opposite. It is inside. It is someone they know and someone very close to them. When we look at women characters in Gothic, we can talk about a remarkable difference in how women characters are portray, portrayed in Gothic literature and in women's Gothic. As Navi suggests, in Gothic literature, women usually have two roles. They are either the dangerous but charming villain or the fragile and vulnerable victim to be rescued by men. In other words, heroes. By many critics, the former portrayal of woman is considered to be a reaction to the new woman or the uh, modern woman. The idea of which is not appreciated by those who believe women should be obedient, motherly and domestic. The retail portrayal is the portrayal of women who are considered to be ideal, obedient, domestic, modest and pure. And they're meant to be taken care of protected and rescued by men. However, in women's Gothic, women are not rescued by men. Just the opposite, they are manipulated, oppressed and tortured by men. The reason why there is such a difference is women writers, as we said, reflect their own experience or the experience of women they know. They do not need to fiction supernatural things or ghosts to be the source of uh, fear or horror. Unfortunately, the biggest source of fear and horror in their lives is the man that they already know. That is the foundation of their writings. And now we will talk about dreams and hallucinations in women's Gothic. In literature, dreams and hallucinations are very important elements for literators to reveal things that they do not want to write openly about. They function as tools to tell more about the inner world of the characters. As well as in Gothic literature, dreams and hallucinations um, perform an important task in women's Gothic. They often reveal uh, the conscious or unconscious fears and fears of the uh, wishes of the characters. And there are ways to express women characters' repressed desires, which women are strictly discouraged to express, if not forbidden or denied to have at all. Dreams and hallucinations can also represent the oppression that women face, psychological violence that women cannot admit to suffer from, even to themselves, is often reflected and revealed in their dreams and hallucinations. If the heroine of the novel suffers from domestic incarceration, their dreams and hallucinations usually carry such symbols as cages or ropes in order to reveal how the freedom of the heroine is restricted by the uh, tyrannic figure in their life. Um, now we will uh, talk about dreams and hallucinations in Elizabeth Bowen's The Demon Lover. In Elizabeth Bowen's The Demon Lover, Kathleen Drover uh, flies back to her family house and finds a mysterious letter which has no stamps. She goes up the stairs, gets in her former bedroom and reads the letter. The letter reminds her of her former abusive fiancé who died at the work. She looks at her palm and sees the scar that was made by the abusive ex-fiancé. 
she feels discomfort as soon as she remembers her former fiance. And throughout the story, the readers are never sure uh, the events taking places, whether the events taking places are dreams, hallucinations, or reality. What is for certain is that the abuse by the tyrannic figure in the story still haunts the heroine, even though the tyrant has been dead for years. A small conversation between the heroine and the ex fiance in the story is enough to see the pressure he put upon the heroine. The reader can easily sense how abusive and how controlling the fiance was. You're going away such a long way, not as not so far as you think. I don't understand. You don't have to, he said. You will. You know what we said. But that was suppose you, I mean, I suppose. I shall be with you, he said. Sooner or later, you won't forget that. You need do nothing but wait. Even though readers cannot observe the abusive relationship between the heroine and the tyrannic figure, the fear that she feels after his death reveals how deeply she was affected by the abuse of the tyrant. This abuse that the heroine most likely tries to ignore and forget about reveals itself in her dreams and hallucinations. Uh, now we will continue with uh, the yellow wallpaper by Charlotte Parkin Gilman. In Charlotte Parkin Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper, the heroine gives birth to a baby and followingly suffers from postpartum depression that many women suffer from. Her condition is to such a point that she does not want to hold her baby in her arms. However, her depression is not taken seriously by her husband who suggests that she has everything she needs as a woman, a successful husband, a baby, and a house to take care of. The fact that her depression is not taken seriously can be observed in the following lines from the story. John is away all day, and even some nights, when his cases are serious. I'm glad my case is not serious, which shows that the husband suggests that her case is not serious. John does not know how much I really suffer, he knows there's no reason to suffer, and that satisfies him. The heroine, whose mental health deteriorates each passing day, day, utters that the nursery room that she's currently staying at makes her condition even worse, and she wants to change rooms. Not surprisingly, her husband denies her request and tells her that they cannot change rooms, even though there's no changeable reason for not to. He claims that the place is actually doing her good, he says, you know the place is doing you good, even though she claims otherwise, he tries to manipulate her. As time passes, the mental health of the heroine gets worse and worse. The yellow wallpaper in the room starts to bother her. She sees that the images and the figures in the wallpaper start to move. And eventually, she sees a woman in the wallpaper that she feels in a way connected. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me, or ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. It's always the same shape, only very numerous. And it's like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. I don't like it a bit, I wonder. I begin to think, I wish John would take me away from here. In the story written by Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the dreams and the hallucinations of the heroine represent the domestic incarceration and violence that the heroine suffers from. She says that in the paper, there, uh, there are things that only she sees, which reveals that her suffering is not seen by nobody except for her. Firstly, her depression is underestimated by her husband which is not very surprising considering that the mental health of women was given no importance at all at the time and instead of being taken seriously, women suffering from severe depression were recommended just to have vacations, which usually made their um, case or condition even worse. And secondly, her problems and worries are considered to be a laughing matter. This can be understood from that whenever she speaks up about her condition, the husband laughs and silences her, calling her little girl, blessed little goose. And her complaints about the nursery room are ignored 
by her husband. Even such a small request as changing rooms is rejected because her husband thinks that the person to decide whether her mental health is affected by the room or not is, uh, is him. Even though it's her mental health, she's nowhere near to be the person to decide that. When the heroine's cry for help remains unheard, the repression the heroine experiences in the yellow wallpaper reveals itself in the character's dream and hallucinations. Without a doubt, the woman trapped in the wallpaper is a direct representation of the heroine, and the heroine feels trapped in her house, more specifically in her nursery room. Likewise, the woman in the wallpaper is trapped in it. I'm getting angry enough to do something desperate. To jump out of the window would be admirable exercise, but the bars are too strong even to try, she says. The author, author's choice to mention the bars of the window is obviously a reference to domestic incarceration and entrapment within the household. At the end, she rips the wallpaper and frees the woman trapped. I don't like to look out of the windows a while. There are so many of those creeping women and they creep so fast. I wonder if they all come out of that wallpaper, as I did. The heroine wonders whether all the women come out of that wallpaper. In other words, they are domestic prison. The author openly suggests that marriage is an imprisonment for most women, if not all women. And the heroine who believes at the beginning that her husband wants the best for her and loves her dearly finally confesses how oppressed and trapped she is to herself only after the oppression she suffers from reveals itself in her dreams and hallucinations. Uh, to conclude, we can say that women writers uh, choose Gothic literature as a way to expre express their discontent towards patriarchy. As Barbara Patrick notes, again and again, women writers found in the supernatural tale metaphors for the unaddressed wrongs women have suffered for the invisibility of women's work and for women's emotional, social, and political oppression. Despite the supernatural and ghostly elements in their stories, women writers never used them uh, as the real source of the fear. They thought that no ghost in a house could haunt them as much as the man in the house. And this brings me to uh, end of my presentation. And thank you so much for your attention and thank you so much for listening. And here you can see my um, citations, um, references, if you want to have a look at. And thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Jan Sohojam, this uh, for this very interesting paper uh, on uh, two very important works in uh, women's literature, right, uh, by Elizabeth Bowen and uh, Gilman. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I think we have about 10 minutes for comments and questions. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, you know, open the floor for comments and questions. Uh, so if any of our friends uh, would like to make any comments or questions, please. Uh, yes, I can see. Um, I think it is Sibel Ulusoy. Sibel Ojan, please go ahead. Uh, you have a question? Sibelo Jan, uh, would you like to go ahead and ask your question or make your comment? We cannot hear you. Perhaps you're you're muted. No. <laughs> okay, perhaps another friend can ask his or her question and uh, Sibel uh, might try again. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, please go ahead and uh, ask your question or make your comment. Uh, can I contribute with half a question and half a comment, maybe. Please, please, Mr. Hojam. I also have some comments and questions, so please go ahead. Thank you very much for your presentation. And it was surprising for me to hear that this is your second presentation at PACES. Am I right? Yes, Hojam. Oh, great, great. Now, I was wondering, 
that uh, you you study uh, women's gothic fiction. Um, do you think that uh, the fact that right, women writers tend to write more gothic fiction uh, stems from stems from some social social gender oppression in the society? Um, yes, Hojan, definitely. I think the reason why they write uh, in this uh, genre uh, this much and this successfully uh, is because they uh, they are political and social position and I think uh, this is actually the reason why I chose to uh, study this uh, genre for my mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Which, which is uh, a very unfortunate and tragic and important problem in our country as well as we all know so yeah. Uh, okay uh, Miraj please go ahead. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Um, I want to make a comment, actually. Uh, as for all of us, I also support uh, these teams. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. There is a professor called uh, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak. Mm -hmm. And she has an article titled, Can Subaltern Speak? In other words, can minorities speak? speak. Uh, long story short, she concludes that uh, they cannot speak as knowledge is never innocent because even the way we express ourselves uh, is standardized, uh, standardized by uh, some certain cultures, some certain uh, major majorities. So uh, in this book, I believe uh, the woman in the wallpaper was moving only uh, when it's moonlight. Uh, as you know, it's, uh, languages have sexes. For example, is, in Spanish, uh, it is sun, uh, which is fem what is female. But in English, moonlight is uh, moon is female. So, as we can see, even the culture uh, prevents us to speak about these uh, problems. So maybe uh, we should start by changing uh, our, uh, our language at, uh, at first, uh, because these kind of books are good, they're okay, but uh, they don't function uh, efficiently uh, as we have some deeper problems. Okay, Jasu, would you like to comment on that? Um, uh, thank you so much for your participation. I read about that uh, moonlight uh, uh, part that your speech uh, in a paper, I think. I think it's a very uh, important information. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. And if you had any asked any questions, I'm not sure if I uh, caught that because your voice was a bit um, uh, coming and going time to time. No, actually, I don't have any question. And also, uh, I remember your presentation, Time and Poetry. Was it right? Oh, really? Yes, it was. Yes, uh, I, uh, because I also participated in PACES uh, in 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I remember your presentation. Thank, thank you for uh, coming back. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. So this conference had already started to form its own audience, followers and participants. Thank you so much, uh, Miraj. And thank you for your question and comment as well. I think Sibel um, is uh, again uh, trying to uh, connect. Uh, Sibel, please go ahead. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Sorry, I had to connect from my phone because my computer is uh, giving me trouble at the moment. First of all, I would like to use these kinds of things uh, in online education, online conferences. So please go ahead. I'd like to thank all of you for giving us to this amazing opportunity. And I'd like to thank Johnson for this brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, so I have recently read uh, the short story, The Yellow Wallpaper. 
uh, which was a part of <laughs> my presentation at uh, MA classes uh, again. And I, I would like to make a comment about it. It's not a, a, actually a question, but I can say that uh, since this uh, short story is accepted as semi-autobiography of uh, per, uh, Gilman's and uh, this uh, reflects how women are repressed not only um, let's say physically uh, but also psychologically since she uh, makes comments of uh, having uh, some bad uh, let's say evil of uh, psycho psychoanalysis or treatment methods because she was uh, prescribed uh, to a resting cure uh, which uh, was uh, doing nothing uh, for the improvement of her mental health. Um, and I'm talking about the unnamed narrative, by, by the way. So uh, can we say that in uh, this short story, uh, Gilman's dream becomes the freedom of women, since she says that women could creep all around the place in uh, just the middle of the night. So uh, when she... Uh, when the uh, woman in the wallpaper breaks free out of that restrictions of the wall. Uh, so this could be, a, can this uh, be a representation of uh, the uh, feminist dream? So, thank you. Um, thank you so much for your question. Exactly, I completely agree with you. I wanted to uh, like talk about uh, Gilman's life, but I didn't have time. And exactly, Gilman was also uh, recommended not to write as the heroine in the story. So I think what a uh, heroine sees in her hallucinations and dreams is actually a representative of what um, Gilman uh, dreams about, what she wants, what she, uh, the freedom that she wants. So you're right, I think it, it can be a representative of Gilman's dream, a feminist dream, yes. Thank you so much for your comments, Beloja. Um, and uh, perhaps we can continue with Ezgi Buruk. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Uh, thank you for this amazing uh, presentation. Uh, I admire it. And uh, this takes my attention uh, so much uh, because I at uh, my course, um, American Culture Vedivete, and I read uh, this story, The Elder Wallpaper, and I also uh, admired it, this uh, story so much. So um, she is expected to uh, do her uh, course domestic roles, and uh, such thing was very important for women uh, because all day uh, they were uh, doing the housework, they were contributing uh, to the house, but um, she cannot because she even uh, cannot have sleeping all day, and maybe because of the uh, medications given by her husband and what kind of medication they were strong, I guess, uh, to oppress her. Um, and she sleeps all day. Uh, what could have cured her? I I would like to ask this uh, because um, she's all, uh, at the house all day and she is medicated. Um, in those times, what could have cured her? Um, thank you so much for your question. I think freedom could have cured her because she wants to write, but she's not allowed to write. Her husband uh, prevents her from writing and she wants to visit, uh, I think her cousins, I'm not sure, but she wants to uh, have a vacation, visit her cousins, but she's again, is not allowed. I think freedom to do what is best for her uh, instead of what uh, her husband says is best for her, could have cured her. So thank you again for your question. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we have time? Uh, other friends have questions, uh, but the time that is allocated for us is, I think, yeah. over. Uh, I would like to ask you if we can take other questions or... 
Just one more question. Okay, okay, thank you. Perhaps Sedan or Cook uh, might ask her question. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, at the very end of the short story, uh, the yellow wallpaper, uh, he says something like, now I have to climb over uh, you again. Because her husband faced when he saw her, see her. Uh, the reason for this is that her husband an abstract obstacle for her before, but now he is a physical obstacle in front of her. Um, thank you so much for your question. Yes, uh, I think so because when she frees the frees herself by like ripping the wallpaper, she says something like, "I did it." Uh, like I did it, although you and uh, Jenny, I think, prevented me from doing it. So when she's in a way frees herself, she does it um, despite uh, what her husband uh, does. So yes, her husband is obviously an obstacle, an abstract obstacle for her, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jansu Ginesh, again, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I had other comments and questions, but I think we will have uh, a chance to discuss them perhaps here at METU. I would like to also thank our participants, uh, you know, who have contributed with their comments and questions. And on a personal note, uh, it was a great pleasure for me to uh, see that, uh, you know, the younger generation is engaging with these uh, very important feminist uh, classics in a very active manner. Uh, so that really gives me hope uh, in this country. So thank you all very much for your comments and contributions. And uh, thank you again, Mehmet Ali Ojan, for this organization. Thank you very and much, Ojan. It was a pleasure for us to have you here. And thank you very much, Jan Sukinesh, for your presentation. I would also thank you for your contributions and for those who asked questions. This was a great experience for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.